Our passage again is Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Purity in life allows for corporate intimacy and worship. When you go to the hospital, do you expect that they'll be able to treat whatever malady that you have? You expect that, right? You expect that there's competency there. You expect that there's knowledge and wisdom there. You expect that the physicians and the nurses and the aides will all treat you with integrity and that they are people of integrity, that they're not going to treat, do surgery on your gallbladder when you've got a cyst on your arm. You just go in there and you trust that because they're people and they have a reputation and the hospital that you go to has a reputation. If it's got a good one, you're going to go with confidence. If it's got a kind of a shady one, you're not going to go with confidence. You just know that I don't have any place closer that's better, so that's why I'm going there. You know, there are some places that call themselves hospitals that we would say are really only aid stations, you know. And if you're going to have this or this procedure done, they're okay. But if you want something more serious, go someplace else because their track record isn't that great. You know, as people look at hospitals, they look at churches too. Is the church that I'm going to go to a safe place? Is it a place that I can be myself? And people aren't going to ridicule me. And people aren't going to put me down. And people aren't going to just, just point things out in my life. Is it a safe place that I can go and I can share my burdens and know that it's not going to be broadcast around the community? Because there are churches that have that reputation, aren't there? If you, share, if you share a prayer request with this group, you know that the whole community is going to know about it. But if you share it with this group, you know that only that group's going to know about it, and that's where you want it to stay. That's what it is in developing a pure and blameless life for ourselves as individuals and then as a church. It becomes known by the people that we encounter that they're safe people. They live out the best they can the things that they say they believe God's telling them to do. You know, hypocrisy is part of the church because we're human. We say that we want to be this way, but sometimes we act this way. The key is not getting comfortable with hypocrisy, but being uncomfortable with hypocrisy, recognizing that we're sinful creatures and that we'll do things against what we believe from time to time, but not being comfortable with that being people who will say we don't want to tolerate that in our lives and we don't want to tolerate that in our congregation. But sometimes we're afraid. We're afraid to say, Charlie, you know what you've been doing really isn't the greatest thing. You're calling yourself a Christian, but you're doing this or you're doing that, and you really should be looking to the Lord and helping you through that. We're afraid to say that to people, aren't we? Charlie's not doing anything wrong. <laughs> I'm just using this as an example. He's the safest one here. <laughs> you know? And Charlie's going, oh, what did I do? What did I do? You didn't do anything, buddy. It's just an example. We do that, though. We're afraid to be honest with brothers and sisters in Christ. And what that does is that allows them to continue on that path unchecked. And because they're part of our congregation, people look and say, you're doing that. And they're not saying anything about it. I don't know about that church. Churches have that kind of reputation, don't they? <laughs> you could probably pick out one or two. That they say you shouldn't do this, but it's going on all over the place in that church. And how can a church really worship intimately when that kind of stuff is going on? And how can it be considered to be a safe place? A place where people can come and find hope, help, and healing. And that's the foundation. The foundation is a pure and blameless life. 
The definition that we find for purity is the Latin word that's used to translate the Greek word purity is sincere. And we've talked about that and I'll mention that in a little bit. But it means to be tested by sunlight. It means to be tested by sunlight. That it's tested by the light of the sun. Uh, a certain thing, if we say that it's pure, it's brought out into the light and it's seen by everybody and it's seen to be pure. Okay? Think about that in terms of our lives. Can, could we comfortably say that you could take me out into the public and fully display my life and it would show nothing but purity? Or are there impurities that I try and cover up and hide? You know, that's on the personal basis. And that would be the same for the church. Can our church be taken out into the community and shown completely by the sun, the light of God's grace, that we're pure? Or is there impurity? So it means to be tested by sunlight. And the Latin word that, that's used is sincere. Um, and it means without wax. And we've talked about that. that it, when Rome went on its conquering binge, they destroyed the Greek and, and other cultures, their fine arts, because they were just out to conquer land. After they'd conquered and they'd established, they recognized that histori historical significance of art. And so they began to gather up art, and people, in an attempt to s make money, would use wax as a glue to glue the pottery back together, or the, the uh, the sculpted pieces of art. And when you'd take it out into the sun, <laughs> the sun would melt the wax and it would show the cracks. And so it came to a point that there was a stamp placed on anything sold and that stamp said it was sincere, meaning without wax, meaning that it was pure. The word also carries the idea of cohesiveness, oneness, and unity. In a sincere Christian life, everything fits together and works together. Nothing is unrelated to the foundation of saving faith and holy living. So we bring our whole life and fit it together under God's guidance, under God's standards for holy living. We don't say, well, I'm going to compartmentalize. This is God's part of my life, and this is my part of my life. I won't do anything to offend God in this part of my life, but I'm not going to worry about God in this part of my life. I'm just going to do what I want to do. There's a crack there. And if it's brought out into the sun, that wax will melt and it will show the impurity. And if the impurity is there, how will people trust our witness and how will people trust whether we can be safe people for them as a congregation? The practical everyday aspect of life is complete harmony. So that I live my life in complete harmony with what I declare. I declare that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Do I live my life in a way that would show people that I'm not living the life in honor of Jesus Christ? I'm not living the life that I'm called to? Or do my words and do my actions for the most part for the majority of my life, come together and my walk and my talk are the same. There are a lot of Christians who talk the talk and don't walk the walk. And we know that. They come to church and they spout off the scriptures and they know how to tell people and they even know how to teach people the scriptures. But when they go out on Monday and go to work, they're anything but what they're talking about on Sunday mornings or Sunday afternoons, or in their church groups. When they're out with their work buddies, they're totally different people than when they're around Christians. We know that happens. The key is, am I as an individual striving to live my life in harmony so that my walk and my talk are the same? Because people will see that. And if they see that your walk and talk are different, you're not going to be seen as a trustworthy person. You're not going to be seen as a person who can speak spiritual truth into their lives. And if people see that as a commonality in our congregation, they're not going to see our church as a safe place to come or a safe place to allow people to talk truth, spiritual truth, into their lives. So purity, in that definition, our walk and our talk are equal. 
Psalm 24, 4 says this, who has a, He who has a clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So purity is important to God. Purity is important to God. Blameless. What's the definition of blameless? It means to be without blame, without spot, without offense for God, a clear conscience before God and man. The word blameless is a compound word, and, and the first part of it is the negative. So you put the negative with the positive, and what it means, what it means is that we're not pushing somebody, we're not causing somebody to stumble, we're not bringing harm or damage, we're not causing them to fall. So if I'm blameless, my life isn't going to be used by the enemy to cause somebody else to fall. You know, a, lot of, a lot of people want to really come in that. Well, you, you can't do that because it may be a stumbling block. Well, that's not really what blameless means. Blameless means that the life that I live, people are going to attack, but will it stick? When they start saying, well, they're this way or they're that way, is it true or isn't it true? Will it stick? To be blameless means the life that I live isn't going to cause somebody else to be dashed. Jesus had something to say about that. He said, woe to the one who causes a little one to stumble. It would be better for them that a millstone be tied around their neck and they be thrown into the lake than they cause a little one to stumble. Do we live a blameless life, a life that is seeking after God? Again, a life where our walk and talk come together. Or by our lifestyle, are we misleading little ones and causing them to go astray? What's our life showing? Am I the same at home as I am at church to the degree that my children can grow in the Lord instead of saying, you know, he says this, but this is the way that he lives. How's our life? How do our children see our lives? Love forms the basis of a pure and blameless life. If we don't really love Jesus with all our heart, we're not going to care about it. Frankly, if we don't have love for God, we're not going to care about how we live our lives. Love and living a life of love of God and of Christ is required for us to have the motivation to live a pure and blameless life. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So love is the motivator, and then when we live that pure and blameless life, then love is a byproduct. So love starts the cycle, and love ends the cycle, as long as we're living a pure and blameless life. It doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. On this earth, we're not going to be. But are we striving to be more and more like Jesus? Um, we have to think about how uh, love in thought, love in life, and love in action come together to be demonstrations of our desire to live like Jesus, of our desire to live a pure and blameless life. A pure and blameless life is a p powerful witness. It's a powerful witness to the community. It's a powerful witness to our families. It's a powerful witness to the world. A pure and blameless life is a life of integrity. A pure and blameless life is a life of integrity. My walk and my talk go together seamlessly. Doesn't mean I won't stumble, but I'm going to get up and I'm going to continue to walk the way that I've learned from Scripture. So my walk and my talk go together. It's like living a life of, living a life of purity and blamelessness is like baking bread. You don't take the flour and the water and the yeast and the butter or margarine and any other ingredients that you would put in and just kind of plop and put it in the oven and out comes a loaf. They have to be mixed together so that they interact with each other. 
so that they become one. And that's what the walk and talk coming together is like. It's like mixing all the ingredients for baking a loaf of bread so that they all come together so they're seen and become as one and they truly do become one. Because no longer, when that loaf of bread comes out of that oven, no longer is it just water and just yeast and just flour. It's a ho- cohesive whole unit. It's a loaf of bread. And that's the way our lives are supposed to be. Living a pure and blameless life. Spiritual integrity also involves relationships with others. In 2 Corinthians, Paul affirmed that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in gra- the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially towards you. So he says it's important, especially within the Christian family, the body of Christ, to live a life of spiritual integrity so that we are living the same life in church that we're living outside of church. Satan's the accuser of the brethren. He's going to send all kinds of accusations against us, both through our internal receptors of our mind and through the words of other people who are going to accuse us of this or accuse us of that. You know, one, one of the low points in my life when I was a, an assistant manager at a Kogos, and we had a discrepancy between our deposits with the bank. And because the regional manager implicitly trusted the manager, guess where the regional manager was looking? <laughs> he was looking at me. He was looking at me to be the thief. And I knew that all my things lined up. My accounting all lined up. I knew that. So it didn't bother me on the sense that I had any sense of guilt, but it bothered me on the sense that he thought that I wasn't a person of integrity. And he thought, and he was so convinced, he was starting to convince my my manager. And we had a real good relationship. And then what happened really showed me his integrity. In checking with the bank, they found out the bank had made an error. Did they ever come to me and tell me that? No. They never came to me after accusing me behind my back and pushing this whole investigation that I was a thief. They didn't come and say anything about it. Eventually, my manager said, oh yeah, that was all dealt with. The bank made an error and just kind of brushed it off. The attacks are going to come, but are they going to stick? If they stick, you're not living a pure and blameless life. You're not living a life of integrity. Your walk and your talk don't match up. So Satan's going to come, and the accusations are going to come, but will they stick? A pure and blameless life is the foundation for corporate intimacy. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If we want to have a life that other people can look at and say, you know, when they speak, even if I don't believe them, when they speak, I listen Because I know that they really believe what they're talking about and they live what they're talking about. Evangelism is more about what's caught than what's taught. We are the only Bible that some people will read. And what they read is, what do you say about your faith and how do you live that? If your walk and your talk don't come together, they're not going to put much stock in the words that you have. And if there are more than a few people in our congregation (laughs) that are like that, people aren't going to put much stock in the congregation as being able to teach spiritual truth. We need to be ones who will walk the walk and talk the talk and walk and talk the walk or walk the talk. (laughs) You know, what we say is what we do. We will stumble. God knows that. He'll forgive us of that. But what's the pattern? What are people going to see? Are they going to see us saying one thing and doing something different on a consistent basis? Or are they going to see us saying, one, saying this and living this way on a consistent basis? If we develop a pure and blameless lifestyle, it will add to the intimacy amongst our congregation. 
And as that intimacy grows amongst our congregation, we'll truly be able to worship God at a deeper level because worship at its heart is an intimate relationship between the worshiper and the one being worshiped. And if we can't be honest before God because we're not honest before each other, it will impact our ability to worship him as he ought to be worshiped. The challenge this week is to examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. Is your walk corresponding to your talk? Is what you believe consistently being lived out in your life? If not, ask God to show you the little changes that you need to make. Don't try and make the dramatic changes overnight because it won't happen. Change happens incrementally. Change that lasts happens incrementally. I'll change this little thing, which will help me to change this little thing, which will help me to change this little thing. And by the time I get down here, that change has been made, and it's going to stick. So the challenge, if we're going to worship in the shadow of the cross the way God wants us to worship him, the, what, the reason Christ died so that we could worship him, then we need to walk a life of purity and blamelessness. Not only just talk about it, but live it. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you that you love us. As we've looked at this topic of purity and blamelessness in our walk and in our talk, and that being the foundation that leads to a greater intimacy amongst ourselves, which leads to a greater ability to intimately worship you, we just pray that you would guide and direct each one of us so that we can make those little changes that will help us by your power and by your strength to be more like Jesus. For we ask these things in his name.